This is the part of the service where we celebrate the Lord's table. Jesus instructed the disciples to take a piece of bread and a cup of wine to remember his body and blood that was given for us at the cross. So each Sunday morning at GBC, we use this part of the service to remember him with a small cracker and a cup of juice and a time of reflection for what Christ did at the cross. Today, I wanna to spend some time looking at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was betrayed by Judas. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible, there are men with Bibles right here that would love to put one in your hand so that you can see God's word written on the pages. Just lift your hand up and they'd like to hand one out to you. If you don't own a Bible, that's yours to keep. As I was preparing for this lesson this morning, I was reading through this account and could not get away from how calm and in control Jesus was at every step. I'm gonna start this morning in verse 44. We're kind of jumping in into the middle of a scene. Jesus had already initiated the Lord's Supper in verse 26, and then he went to Gethsemane to pray. And we're gonna pick it up at the end of that time. So look at verse 44 with me. And he left them, them being Peter, James, and John. He left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Jesus understood what was about to happen. And he understood not with intuition. John 13, 27 tells us that during the supper, Jesus turned to Judas and told him, what you do, do it quickly. Jesus was prepared for this moment. And picking up in verse 47, it says, and while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12 came up and with him was a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately Jesus, or Judas went to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said, friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus, other accounts note that this is Peter, stretched out his hand and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Therefore, how will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that this must happen this way? At this time, at that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place in order that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Every act of this entire narrative is beautifully intentional. But what I wanna focus on this morning is the act that Jesus tells us he didn't do. Look again at verse 53. Jesus says, Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once at my disposal put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus turned to Peter and was basically saying, Have you been paying attention? There's such an interesting contrast here to verse 39. Jesus, knowing this is coming, asked the Father for another, any other way. He doesn't want to be arrested. He's not looking forward to this moment he finds himself in. But Jesus expressed continued submission to my father, through whom he could request an angelic army. But at the same time, he asserted that if he were to make such a request, the father would at once grant him 72,000 angels. This is the intentionality Jesus went to the cross with. This is the intentionality he went to his death with. At any moment, at his simple word, the sky could blaze forth with a tremendous host of mighty angels whose swords could annihilate these enemies. That is the real help Jesus could call. How silly for Peter to flash his little human sword. 
Jesus showed, showed this amid, ability many times when he was on earth. My mind fall, goes straight to Matthew 8 when he calmed the storm. Even then, he rebuked the disciples for being fearful. So not only were they aware of this power, but they had already been rebuked for not putting their trust in it. Leon Morris says it this way, Peter has overlooked a most important matter. Do you think? Introduces a question the apostle might have well have asked before he acted. He had been with Jesus for quite a long time now. Did he really think the master was defenseless? Did Peter really think he could not ask the heavenly father for help? And if he did seek such help, would it not be given? Jesus says that the father would then provide him more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus made it clear to his servant that if force were needed, there were better means of providing it than resorting to the puny efforts of a man who could do no better than slice off a slave's ear. So why didn't Jesus call down 72,000 angels? Look at verse 54. Therefore, how will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? Jesus had a purpose this night. Jesus reminded the disciples that their was a purpose to all that was happening. He was not struggling to escape because he was there to fulfill the Father's eternal purpose. They had been revealed, this had been revealed centuries before through the scriptures, and they said this must happen this way. Linsky says, as in the Father, so in the incarnate Son, the will to redeem us by that Son's blood and death was his and his alone, with absolutely nothing outside to coerce that will. From the beginning to the end, this was true. Jesus going to the cross was within his complete control the entire time. At any moment, he could have walked away, but he didn't. Romans 5 tells us why. For while we were still ye weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to even die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The us in this passage is those who have put their trust in Jesus and are justified by faith. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we need to reflect on these truths of the gospel. Christ went to the cross in complete control. Christ went to the cross to fulfill scriptures. Christ went to the cross to demonstrate his love for us. However, maybe you don't recognize that Jesus went to the cross to take your deserved punishment for your sins. Maybe you have not put your trust in Christ and his death on the cross. We're glad you're here, but this time is for those who put their trust in Christ. Please let the elements pass by and think about what it means that a Savior went to the cross to die for your sins. Men, will you serve us?